Young people are full of fantastical visions of the world, and many of them subscribe to a myriad of ideologies. Believing that they could bring the world, or at least their nations, into a better place. When these enthusiastic young fellows see an opening, an opportunity to fulfill their ideologies or beliefs, their emotions and energies kick into gear, and they are ready. Not only to spend time and effort achieving their vision, but they also are open to extremes of sacrifice, physical, and even more ominously, moral. To attain their goals, these vigorous people are sometimes so adamant on their visions that they are willing to sacrifice ideals and morals previously held high in their individual and collective psyche. Values like kindness, respect, and even honor. But what is truly heartbreaking is that with time and experience, and after encountering failures more often than hoped, those youth, essentially revolutionaries, invariably sober off their lofty ideals and fantasies and abandon their struggle altogether. And in some cases, they may even turn with age against the ideals and morals they had sacrificed for. The revolutionary essentially turns into a reactionary, a traitor of his own values. Still, reneging back on one's previous beliefs and commitments is a hard pill to swallow for many people. They would be seen as traitors by their fellow comrades, and they would be the target of ridicule of their enemies and the society at large, and of course the testament of history. That's why, the cunning and wily of those recanting revolutionaries would slowly remodel their stance and reinvent their public image while fumbling around with plausible reasons to justify their change of heart. In the mother of all revolutions, the French Revolution, we have two figures who have managed to shift their positions in such a mercurial way. Joseph Fauché and Maurice de Talera. They fought fervently for the 1789 French Revolution and its ideals, becoming some of its greatest heroes. But then they reneged and turned out to be some of the most notorious adversaries of the revolution and its holiest of ideals. Our episode's protagonist is Joseph Fauché, Duc d'Etrante, a great example of politics' greatest mercurial transformations. During his active political years, he would turn out to be one of the most feared French statesmen, an important and consequential leader of the French Revolution. And more importantly, the preeminent minister of the police force during the turbulent revolutionary period, during the French Napoleonic Empire, and even during the early years of the Bourbon Restoration. He will even be written down in history as the progenitor of the modern police state in functional autocracies. Joseph Fauché was born in Nantes on May 21, 1759. Young Fauché was enrolled in a school run by the Oratorians in Nantes. But before he was ever ordained, the French Revolution erupted in 1789. With the progressively increasing persecution of the Catholic Church in France during the Revolution, the Oratorian Order was dissolved in 1791. Fauché, who joined the ranks of the revolutionaries from early on, joined the local Jacobin club. The Jacobins, formerly Society of the Friends of the Constitution, were the most politically active and violent group of the revolutionaries. Their ideals originated in Paris, but its affiliate clubs soon sprang throughout the French provinces. Briefly, after joining Nantes' Jacobin club, Fauché managed to become its president. And on September 16, 1792, he got elected to the National Convention as a deputy of Nantes. By that time, power in the National Convention was already contested between the moderate Girondins faction and the more radical of the Jacobins, the Montagnards. Initially, Fauché sided with the Girondins, but when he voted for the execution of Louis XVI, he shifted to the Montagnards' side. With the Montagnards clinching power within the convention, Fauché was assigned some important commissions. After the war was declared on Britain in early 1793, Fauché was sent to the provinces to make sure of their loyalty to the National Convention and to quell any rebellions. Centralization of power in Paris, in addition to the increasingly republican and anti-Catholic attitudes of the revolutionary government, alienated the provincial populace, the local notables, the conservative peasants, and the Catholic believers. In October of 1793, Fauché arrived in Lyon and immediately unleashed a savage campaign of prosecutions. He executed hundreds on the guillotine, conducted mass shootings, and destroyed landmark buildings of the city. Not to mention his scandalous public charades deriding the Christian beliefs and the Catholic practice, ridiculing the major Christian figures, and ordering the priests to abandon celibacy. 
His actions were so horrifying to the extent that none other than Robespierre criticized him openly. Robespierre, the brutal revolutionary at the helm of power at that time, denounced Fauché's massacres and his radical dechristianization efforts. Fauché was recalled to the convention in April 1794. He became briefly the president of the Jacobin Society, but had to abandon it after Robespierre's fierce and continuous attacks. It was then that Fauché embarked on his career-long, infamous scheming practices against his enemies. And now his major nemesis was none other than the most feared politician in Paris, Robespierre. Fauché managed to brilliantly organize a coalition of politicians who, like him, were hostile to Robespierre and feared for their lives. The coordinated efforts blindsided the all-too-confident Robespierre. He lost his powers in July and was promptly executed. Fauché later joined forces with the Directory which presided over France from 1795 to 1799. During this period, Fauché behaved and acted as expected of any proper Jacobin. After a brief coup d'état in September 1797, Fauché was sent as an emissary to Milan and then to The Hague. Then on July 20, 1799, he was appointed to his career's most prominent position — Minister of Police. A few months later, during the 18th of Brumaire coup, which corresponds to November 9, 1799, Fauché would turn out to be one of the most important supporters of Napoleon Bonaparte. Kept in his ministerial position by Napoleon, Fauché would embark upon organizing the police and creating a secret police force. While a supporter of Napoleon Bonaparte, Fauché was opposed to his increasing autocracy. As a member of the Senate, he opposed the proposition of making Napoleon Bonaparte counsel for life because he expected correctly that it would be just a stepping stone in the process of turning the new republic into Napoleon's own fiefdom or kingdom. Punishing him for his opposition, Bonaparte removed Fauché from office, in effect, abolishing the Ministry of Police. But that sent the entire French police force into a state of great disarray. To stop the disintegration of the police, Napoleon reinstituted the ministry and brought the capable Fauché once again to its helm. But only after Fauché had bent to Napoleon's wishes, voting in the Senate, not only for Napoleon's life appointment, but also to the proclamation of the empire and Napoleon as the emperor of France. In recognition of his renewed allegiance, Napoleon elevated Fauché to the rank of count in 1808 and even declared him the Duc de Trente in 1809. He was also assigned the Ministry of Interior, in addition to that of the police in 1809. However, continued war and the exhaustion of the French military made Fauché doubtful of the future of Napoleon and his empire. He resumed his favorite habit of scheming. He started to conspire with the royalists and with foreign powers, most importantly Britain. Napoleon got wind of Fauché's behind-the-scene intrigues and was especially angry with Fauché's recruitment efforts to staff up the National Guard with troops loyal only to him. Napoleon once again dismissed Fauché from the Ministry of Interior and Police in October 1809 and sent him to govern the Roman states. But before even attending to his new office, Fauché's correspondence with the British was discovered and he was sent to stay in Aix-en-Provence for the next three years. Then he was sent to the Illyrian provinces, but after their fall to the Austrians, he was then sent on a mission to Naples, then under the rule of Joachim Murat, Napoleon's brother-in-law and one of his preeminent generals. With Napoleon's fall in 1814, after his disastrous Russian campaign, Fauché returned to Paris in April 1814. He was offered the Ministry of Police by the government of the restored Bourbon monarchy of Louis XVIII, but Fauché declined. However, upon Napoleon's 100 days return from his exile in Elba, Fauché would accept the Ministry of Police. Fauché tried to convince Napoleon to adopt some sort of liberal approach to governance this time around. Napoleon refused. That led Fauché to start conniving once again with the Bourbon allies of Louis XVIII and the Austrian diplomats, most notably Clemens von Metternich. After the decisive defeat in Waterloo, June 1815, Fauché was one of the more influential people to convince Napoleon to abdicate. Fauché was even elected as the president of a provisional government. Later when Louis XVIII returned to power, Fauché was made minister of police. But soon his past came biting at him. 
When the ultra-royalist started digging his regicidal history, he was quietly sent away as an envoy to Dresden. Then after being publicly prescribed as a regicide in 1816, he stopped serving the government and went to Austria to live in exile in Prague, Linz, and finally in Trieste, where he died on December 25, 1820. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to follow our future videos. Thank you and catch you on the next one. Bye.